Hello, listeners. Welcome again to the Of Record Zoom call. Uh, <laughs> we are starting this one off. This is our longer news segment. I know you guys have been hit, hitting us with those dailies every time, so hopefully you've been enjoying those. Um, we're doing our longer news in the digital marketing space. So, uh, Joe, let's go ahead and take it off with the first story. All right, and I want everybody to listen to this one carefully. This is producer Kyle's last podcast <laughs> ever. Freaking sad. We'll talk about that a little later, though. Um, All right. First story. I think this is an interesting one. So we've talked about this before on the podcast plenty, but net neutrality. So if you're not familiar, uh, and by the way, the story is out of the verge. Self-isolation has stressed networks and no one knows if the FCC can step in. So net neutrality basically says your internet service provider has to treat every website as equal. So it can't throttle some websites up and some websites down. Uh, And that's to prevent providers uh, from doing things like, you know, let's say Comcast buys um, Netflix, that would prevent Comcast from slowing down Amazon Prime, but making Netflix faster. Or maybe they don't charge you for streaming Netflix, but they do charge you for streaming a competitor. Uh, the problem now is with so much demand for HD video coming across broadband networks is the ISPs don't have a way to, say, slow down Netflix so that your Zoom call can still go fast uh, in your house. Say your neighbor's watching 4K Netflix. Uh, (laughs) So they don't have a way to manage the bandwidth demand. And this is no surprise. The United States has been notoriously uh, bandwidth constrained, uh, basically from the beginning of our internet life, because the United States, we were the first to lay the cable. And so we had the oldest generation infrastructure in place. And some countries you know, even Europe, South America that have come uh, on later into broadband have a more updated infrastructure than we do for this. Mm, So yeah, bandwidth limitation. Now it's been improving over the past four or five years. There's been a lot of new cable laid in the United States. Uh, But overall, the bandwidth uh, restriction is a problem. And I think you're going to hear more and more about this as people uh, sink more deeply into endless queues of Netflix viewing and Zoom calls. Yeah, wasn't a part of that article as well as like the FCC also because of the like net neutrality stuff doesn't have any oversight really of these companies. So a lot of like Netflix Correct. and them yep. are actually like self throttling like YouTube and Netflix have actually like self imposed throttles yep. on themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so it's a more complicated legal situation than probably mm-hmm. I just gave net neutrality, uh, you know, precedents for. The interesting thing is it's been one of those flip situations where before uh, being pro net neutrality would have been thought of as a more socially conscious thing to be, whereas now that's kind of flipped where maybe mm-hmm. – uh, maybe being anti-net neutrality is the more socially conscious thing <laughs> yeah. to be. So yeah. uh, just one of the many issues that have 180 in recent yep. times. Uh, also out of Business Insider, digital ad firms are finding themselves pinched between publishers and advertisers. And the industry insiders say some could go under as the financial pressure on ad tech firms could strengthen tech giants. So basically what's going on is as ad prices fall, the uh, the percentage of CPMs that are being kept by these smaller ad tech firms remains the same, but the overall dollar amount falls. Uh, also, these firms are you know notoriously high burn rates. Some of them are venture backed, so they're not profitable yet. So what you're seeing, and this is probably going to be a larger piece uh, across markets, not just digital, uh, is a collapse of smaller players and actually increasing the relative market power of the bigger players. So in this case, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Google uh, increasing. And that's again, because the market pressures are going to hit the weakest first and in a very competitive industry where Facebook and Google specifically have so much pricing power, uh, it becomes tough for those smaller ad tech companies to sustain. What are, like, can you give an example of, like, a smaller ad tech company? Uh, there's a company uh, we've used a lot uh, called El Toro that okay. does uh, IP and really narrow geofence targeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I don't know, you know, that they are probably fine for all I know. That's not to say, but that's just an example of a smaller ad tech company. 
that they're all around and some of them aren't consumer products. Like some of them are going to be intermediaries between publishers and advertisers. So you might not even know about the product. It just may be operating on, you know, um, a certain publisher's website on a back end. Okay. This is like Spotify, not into like, but does Spotify like come into an ad tech platform as well now? Well, Spotify is not just ad tech. Spotify is a whole platform, right? So Spotify has the media. Spotify is both the publisher and the ad tech platform. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Similar to YouTube in a, in a, in some ways. Mm -hmm. So uh, another story here out of Business Insider, uh, ad insiders from Burger King, Freshly McCann, and Avida Coco say coronavirus will radically change advertising from elevating brand marketing to shrinking the holding companies. So there's a couple things going on. One is uh, WPP, the largest uh, advertising holding company in the world, announced today it was uh, reducing its outlook by 16%. Uh, which is huge in the publicly traded stock world, uh, and also going to go ahead and do layoffs and furloughs uh, due to the decrease in marketing spending, not just this quarter, but it looks like next quarter as well. Uh, so you're seeing that impact on the holding companies. And then the other is you have a whole segment of marketing events and experiential uh, that probably goes away in a rough economic time, and especially when people are afraid to go outside. So for example, uh, would you want to be a buyer of outdoor advertising right now in stadiums? No, no probably not. Yeah. Probably really wouldn't be a buyer of, of billboards right now. Probably a rough time. Mm-hmm. Probably a rough time to sell bus advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I think you're going to see here is a movement towards a very hardcore performance-based advertising. So click here to buy, here's a list of values of the product or functions Mm -hmm. of the product, Uh, here's a sale. So going back to, you know, your Google AdWords, Facebook performance, Amazon ads, I think this whole of this whole series is going to be, we did a podcast about this last week, great for Amazon. One of the things we didn't talk about is in a world where Amazon is the world's biggest retailer, Amazon also happens to be uh, the world's third largest advertiser or advertising platform. Uh, so ad buys on Amazon are probably going to spike and go through the roof. And again, as a result of this change in advertising. Yeah, I mean, um, and also I think, I mean, this is a different article, but I saw is like a lot of people, uh, a lot of buyers are actually like thinking about switching to like OTT platforms as well, like getting their outdoor spend and moving it or traditional spend and moving it towards the like OTT market. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously OTT is probably a really good place to be right now. Yeah. (laughs) And Amazon also has some of the biggest OTT platforms. (laughs) Yeah. And we're not like, we haven't done a story about like Roku at all. Like Roku is still putting out like good technology and like making advancements in their technology. So like, I'm sure they're, you know, and, and it's a right. winner. You're not really seeing listed right now. Everybody talks about Netflix mm-hmm. or Amazon Prime or Disney Plus. Well, on the back end of a lot of those devices that streaming those services is Roku. Yeah, it's just the underdog of like ad tech platforms. Like no yeah, one I mean, really like talks about it. it. Doesn't get news. Only like making improvements. You know. Yeah, it's literally the infrastructure in a lot of ways. Of right. It. Uh, you like know, no one you blames have an actual Apple TV road or a Chromecast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And then our uh, last story here, a bit of practical news. Facebook rolls out experiments to simplify the campaign testing process for marketers. So uh, if you're not familiar, you don't buy Facebook ads often. Facebook over the last two years has had several iterations of um, of their ad testing tools uh, to be honest, I found it confusing over the last couple of years. What are best practices? What should I use for certain things? What they've landed at is a very simplified version of this. They call it test and learn, where you put an ad in and it first goes through a testing phase. And then once it finishes a testing phase, it's fully deployed. And they've basically now have it set up where when you're, when you're creating the ad at the campaign level, you can flick a toggle button that says a b test and then it guides you through setting up the a b test so it's become a lot more user friendly uh and like i said over the past two years there's been some relatively complex iterations of the test Mm -hmm. and learn phase probably facebook couldn't be bringing this on at a better time for advertisers as well 
Yeah, I mean, did they? Um, because dynamic is that is that what they kind of replaced with dynamic? Like they replaced this dynamic with this. Is what I mean. So like, is dynamic. One going? of the differences between and there you you know Facebook is a black box and how it tests, and so you can't mm-hmm. see on the back end. So there's probably mm-hmm. a lot of the same tech behind it. Um, dynamic isn't truly uh testing anything for you what dynamic is doing is it's taking mixes of creative and then serving those mixes to the the person the type of profile it thinks is going to respond best to that mix of photo text and headline right right so you don't really know you can see you know which graphic got the most clicks or uh conversions or which uh post text did but you're not really testing facebook's just mm. serving to you know, what, what does it think Kyle's going to like best and it's going to serve that to you? Yeah. Uh, with test and learn, what you're doing is you're actually doing a statistically valid test of your creative. And there's a control group and there's scientifically sized sample groups that you're serving the creative to. Uh, and you have to have an audience that's big enough and you have to generate enough impressions and it gives you um, an error rate in there. So this okay. is much, much closer to the type of uh, ad testing maybe a pollster would do uh, oh, okay. or maybe a statistician uh, would do to test effectiveness. Well, so like where do you see, because I think we've had this conversation like probably a year ago or something was like they're they're moving towards algorithm-based ad buying. So like where, where are we at now? Yep. Like where do you see where we're going? We're almost to the end of that. In fact, Facebook put out some guidance earlier this week to advertisers about ads optimization and suggested – um, use ad set optimization, which basically means uh, set your campaign budget and then oh, let yeah. Facebook decide between your audiences who should get what spend and when. Uh, and the second thing they suggested is use as broad of audience as possible. So don't go really niched and deep with your audiences and have you know guys named Kyle who like motorcycles and Jeeps. Just set your targeting to uh, men 18 to 35 who like cars and yeah. then let let Facebook figure out which one of those uh, it performs best with. They're like, okay. So they're actually, so in like this interesting way, the things they got in trouble for a while ago, they just kind of took it out of the hands of the buyer and put it into an algorithm where Not, it's still. Yeah, and so in a, yeah. in a really crazy way where, what freaked people out, we've said this for a while, was the targeting, the targeting, and they <laughs> yeah. can target. Well, now they don't even need to target because yeah. the AI on the back end is so good at figuring out what you're going to like. Yeah. So the targeting is fast becoming a thing of the past. Uh, and what is the future is having enough creative variance to understand or to have the best opportunity to find what different audiences like or different people like. Right. And so in a way, we took away, like, you could see the targeting, which, like, freaked people out more than, like, an AI doing the targeting and finding what out what you liked. Yeah, even though yeah. arguably you might should be freaked out more about the AI <laughs> yeah. targeting, but, uh, yeah. you know, whatever, that's where they've gone. And it's, uh-huh. uh, you know, it is more effective most of the time. Yeah, now, and it some- opens a platform. Yeah, it makes the platform a lot easier to place buys on. You don't have to be a very smart marketer and think about audiences and segmentation anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, You just have to have some creative, have a roundabout idea of who you want to target and then let give Facebook the goal. Is it get people signed up for your email list, sell your t-shirts, whatever it is, and let Facebook figure it out for you. Wait, and I know we're probably spending too much on this article, but I think it's super interesting. Like, how do you think this affects ad buyers in the long run as well. Does it devalue it? Where do you find more value in being a buyer? Yeah, it it devalues the technical ad buyer, right? Because if you are good enough to stick a Facebook pixel or a Google pixel on your website Mm -hmm. and you understand the basics of how the ad products work, uh, you don't need to be a genius marketer in terms of, you know, figuring out who to target. Uh, What you need to be is probably a good copywriter, maybe Mm -hmm. a good graphic designer, maybe a good storyteller. Like, you know, bad content is still going to be bad content. Mm -hmm. Um, But as far as the, you know, I'm the marketing genius who decided, you know, that, uh, you know, women 45 to 64 Mm -hmm. who shop at Talbot's 
and Whole Foods are the best audience for this, that is, that's coming to a close. Yeah. So where do you find value? Like, where do you provide the value in the copywriting? Is that what you're saying? The creative. Yeah. yeah so the okay. copywriting, the graphics, the videos, um, you know, right now the battle for most advertisers is, and this is part of the, is for the last five years, everybody's trained their clients to more creative and more targeting and more tinkering with things to mm -hmm. find the best, the best outcome, but that's changed. So now what you try and do is tell clients, approve this creative slate and then just let, let it go. Yeah. Just don't do anything. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, which is basically a 180 from what um, marketing consultants and ad consultants were telling clients the past five years. Right. Okay. All right. That's some good insight. So next we're going to talk about uh, the ad economy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect it's, introduction. Let me sum this up. It's down. <laughs> and, I, and I think we've said this previously where ad prices on the big platforms are as low as I've ever seen them since I started doing this in 2012, 2013. So that is pre anybody caring about Facebook as an advertiser. So mm -hmm. CPMs for uh, lead gen ads below $10. CPMs for uh, web click ads below $2. It's, it's insane. Uh, yeah. And these are uh, oftentimes two and three and four times cheaper than they were just the beginning of the month. And this is due entirely from the market clearing out. People are spending more time on the platform. So there's more eyeball time and then there's less advertisers, which drives those CPMs lower. So the numbers uh, from analyst Cohen and company uh, suggest Facebook is going to be down $15.7 billion or 18.8% down. Google is going to be down $28.6 billion. That's about 18.3%. Twitter down $701 million, about 17%. And Snapchat down $977 million, or about 31.8 below their estimates. These are, these are big, big uh, ad losses yeah. uh, being taken out of these companies. Now, these companies are in good shape they have big cash reserves they'll probably still be profitable by the end of the year but that is a big big bite out of revenue and it's important to remember about these companies because i think people who just watch from the outside don't realize what facebook and google and twitter really are they're not technology companies they're advertising sellers they're advertising mm -hmm. companies that's it that's that yeah. is the primary piece of their the bit of their revenue Yes, yeah, so I think people look at those and like, oh, that's not just, you know, that's not their main business line. And like, that's incorrect. That is, <laughs> that is their main business line that's losing 18 points on top of yeah. it. So. Uh, and then I have some uh, research out of the IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, which is the trade group for online advertisers. So they say uh, about 24% of respondents have paused all advertising for the rest of Q1 and Q2. So that means that's going to go out uh, through the end of June, uh, yeah. would be paused on all advertising. 46% of respondents are adjusting advertising, probably down for most of them, for the uh, rest of Q1 and Q2. So uh, big, big decreases in the numbers of people planning to buy. Uh, just right now, digital ad spends are down 33%. Traditional media is down 39%. Uh, the types of advertising have changed. Mission-based advertising up 42, cause-related mm. up 41. Uh, but there have been some increases. Advertisers are doing more audience targeting, ironically, <laughs> 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 because they think that's going to make it uh, you yeah. know, lower cost because they're targeting smaller segments. Right. Uh, and then OTT targeting up 35%. I mean, Kyle, I know you look through this. Did anything yeah. stand out to you? My thing, because, uh, you know, we're all looking to the future already, I feel like. Like, we're already looking at the future. Like, oh, well, everything's just going to, you know, whoop, we're right back to normal, you know? Like, even second, like, third quarter, fourth quarter stuff, like, they're going to be on 
on target. Everybody, I feel like, has that feeling. But this one really got me. Um, so percent of buyers making ad spend changes in second half of 2020, 67% are still to be determined right now. So everybody still hasn't even decided what they're doing for the second half, like if yeah. they're going to continue or if not. Um, I think there's another one also. Um, so percent of marketing making advertising spend changes in the second half. Um, they're only projected to get to 75% of their estimated uh, original plan in the third quarter and 88% of their fourth quarter. So, I mean, right there you see percentage losses versus their original plans in those second half quarters. So yeah. And if they're down, if they're planning on being down in the fourth quarter, yeah. that's a, that's a big problem. Cause that's the, that's the money making time for everybody. Mm-hmm. So that's not just a reflection. That's bad for the platforms and the ad buyers. It's also bad for the underlying businesses. Yeah. Another thing in here I thought was interesting is when you look at the types of decreases, the biggest decreases coming in digital display and digital video, with so at 41 and 37 percent, and the lowest decreases social media at 33 percent, uh, March, April, and paid search at 30 percent, March, April. Mm-hmm. And again, this is because I think we're moving back into a performance marketing phase, like the marketing has to demonstrate its ROI, uh, in order to be valuable or for the client to sign off on it. Yeah. And this is a unique um this is a unique time because most larger marketing companies aren't oriented around performance, they're oriented around brand. Well, I think also, I mean, this is kind of a tangent from what we were talking about, but it, I keep seeing the Olympics on this um and I don't think we've really spoken about the Olympics. I mean, they're saying like there was like 1.8 billion dollars in advertising spots already sold. Um, yeah. I think it's the number I have to find that article. Is, that, is NBC going to just hold on to that money? For <laughs> yeah. Them? And so they have insurance <laughs> out against those like ad spots. And so like, I mean, that's why they're not canceling the Olympics because if they have to cancel it, uh, they got to figure out what they need to do with that. So they're really playing that super slow game on yeah. the Olympics. Like, you know, we'll drag this out for three years if we have to. Um, really just because of the advertising <laughs> ad spots. Um, you know, so what's funny about that it, with the events, at least, is most big events actually are insured. And so what yeah. you will see for Olympics being canceled or sporting events is is you'll see some insurance money come into these companies and backfill. Mm-hmm. Then what you have to find is where will those advertisers put their money? Because there's some advertisers who are going to do better. Like uh, the right. consumer package could companies will probably be up. A lot of the food companies will probably be up. Uh, so you're going to have people who are looking for places to put money. Mm -hmm. Um, so that I, first of all, I, I mean, I'm not like super into this stuff, but the IAB article is very, very good. Um, if anybody like, like I would recommend someone, you guys look at that. So, yeah. Uh, and it's pretty detailed. I mean, what Mm -hmm. they show here is fairly catastrophic. About half of advertisers think this is going to be worse than the recession was, Right for them. So, I mean, again, the net impact on the market is going to be consolidation. Uh, the, the strongest companies are the largest companies for the most part in that ad space. So Amazon, uh, Facebook, Google. Uh, and you'll have a lot of the smaller ones just kind of collapse and move out. And so you'll be mm-hmm. left with, I think Amazon, I think you won't have the duopoly anymore. It won't just be Amazon, Google. It's going to be, or it won't just be uh, Google, Facebook. It'll be Facebook, Amazon, Google. Mm-hmm. So I think you'll have like a triumvirate of companies that account for 70 plus percent of digital ad spend. Yeah, I also haven't seen anything about like music streaming ad sales or anything. I, I probably should look for an article on that one. But like, because we just talking about OTT, like we don't, I mean, you don't think about streaming more music during these days or more podcasts on podcast apps. Yeah. So like, I'd like to see how that's affecting that. Well, it, you know, if you are an advertiser yeah. that it, your demand isn't impacted by coronavirus, uh, it's a great time to be buying. Mm-hmm. There's more eyeball, more ear time than you could have ever imagined. Right. Consumption is up 20 and 30 and 40%, depending on your demographic. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the prices are down. So, you know, for, for people that are up, it is a great time to be up. I'm trying to think, I feel like I saw that in the, in the IEB that like a percentage of have actually adjusted to increase. It was like 10 or 12%. 
Yeah. So this is, I need you to explain this to me, Joe. It says digital ad spend is down 33%. Traditional media is down 39%. The majority of advertisers are, are, are adjusting their messaging and are increasing. Oh, mission-based marketing, cause related yeah. marketing. Okay, I, types of messaging. I thought it meant ad spend at first. Yeah. So, sorry. Um, all right, are we ready for uh, your farewell segment? Yeah, sure. I don't right. know what this is. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, do you want to say what you're going to go do? Oh, yeah. So I am taking an opportunity to move back down to uh, my hometown after well, how many years have I been in Tallahassee? Seven years in Tallahassee um, since going to school. And this will be my third year at SDS. Um, so I'm moving back to my hometown of New Smyrna Beach and to work with the family business. So my family business, uh, my brother-in-law, my dad, my mom and my dad and my sister are all uh, um, run a like contract con- contract gosh contracting and you should construction learn to say what the business company. does definitely well, it's, it's hard because you try to say contracting and construction yeah. and you just want to make it one word um so they are running that and they've you know been asking for the last you know probably eight months to come back home um and so I thought COVID was a great time. To yeah, to make <laughs> start running a business. So why not? <laughs> um, but no, I made the decision, uh, you know, three weeks ago. And so um, I will no longer be on of record, which Nipa is hanging out in the shadows. Um, you can't Nip- hear her. Nipa's waiting her. in the wings to take over. <laughs> so her and uh, also we have some great, um, you know, staff that is uh, getting trained up that will also be making appearances. So. If they ever are able to return, we that's don't know. true. Yeah, well, they could do the zooms for sure. Yeah, just so. maybe permanent, permanent zoom. So. What are the, you know, what are the lessons you think you've learned working in uh, marketing, advertising, production mm-hmm. that you think will help you run a construction business? Well, I mean, like. I say this a bunch, but like, I, I honestly, like personally, like these are the things like personally, I didn't know how to write a, uh, a professional email to a client before I got in this industry, which, uh, is something I do every day now, multiple times. (laughs) Um, also professional phone calls. Like, I mean, things like that are like, I feel like are some of the most valuable stuff because if you can talk to somebody, um, you can basically, you know, hopefully work for them and do work for them. Um, Another thing is like social media advertising. I mean, digital marketing advertising. Um, like that's something I didn't know about either. And so if you know, like you can do that with just a couple, I mean, it's getting a little bit, I mean, just a couple bucks. I mean, you can make a huge yeah. impression in an area where maybe nobody is doing it. And so that, and then just a professionalism. Um, that's my biggest thing is just professionalism and using technology and data uh, to like increase that professionalism is uh, a big thing I learned at SDS and, and in this market. So, yeah, that's interesting. I think for, you know, my guess is like 50 or 80 bucks a week Yeah. on, you know, Facebook, you could probably generate a handful of leads. Now, depending on the construction business you're mm-hmm. in, a handful of like leads on, on projects from right. And then even just like in commercial side of it, like being at an agency and in this world, like doing proposals, like, you know, just knocking those proposals out and doing a great job. I mean, is also another way to just push you above whoever the competition is currently. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure you have probably a lot of opportunities for RFPs. Mm -hmm. Oh, plenty of RFPs, I bet, in construction. Well, like what's funny now is like I was talking to my brother-in-law when we were first like talking about this and like he got a big project and a reason he got a big project is he, his bid was more like the, it would cost the the city and municipality that he's working for more, more dollars. Um, but he sent in a professional proposal. I mean, and professional was a slide deck with just information on the slide deck. Right. And the, and the, the competitive competitor he was going against literally submitted a piece of paper with a quote on it. And so that, that right there pushed him over the mark. I, I think you could make beautiful slide decks, Kyle. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, man. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Uh, I mean, I was going to say, like, I mean, also, like, I mean, SDS, like, you guys have known, but, like, podcasting has become, like, 
you know, a passion of mine personally, not only listening to podcasts, uh, starting off listening to Joe Rogan with everybody in the office <laughs> and then moving on to, uh, I guess, more uh, produced podcasts uh, nowadays. More and so, intellectual podcast. Yeah. And then so just being able to work on these podcasts and like be a part of it, being behind the scenes and being like producer Kyle has honestly been like, you know, I'll never forget that stuff. And it's been like a dream working <laughs> in a podcasting space um, and learning how all that crap works. Cause now I can, I mean, we've had ideas, Joe, for a while. So, you know, hopefully I'll get to work on some of those in my free Yeah, you time. might actually have time to do it now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I won't be doing it at work and then yeah. come home and try to do it. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Any, uh, any, any last things? We all have a couple of, uh, day, yeah. you know, one day podcasts here. before we. Yeah, I mean, this goes up okay. Thursday. So, I mean, I don't know if I'll be on Fridays daily, but Friday is my last day. So, we'll have to, I don't know. Maybe we'll buy some, like cook champagne like yeah to toast <laughs> Blink. Blink. <laughs> to do that so i mean it's strange if you had told me like three months ago i'd be ending my time at sds uh in my house talking <laughs> on a Zoom i mean i'm not even sure that's the strangest thing about the present time to be honest with you I mean, but it's a strange thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'd be like you're weird dude get away from me yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so all right, dude. Oh, well, farewell, producer Kyle. We'll we'll play some some sad music at the end, <laughs> like a montage. <laughs> Nipa, can we I edit mean, a montage in at the yeah, end? I need a not montage, please. I mean, which is every, like maybe every Michelle episode. Branch, like "Goodbye to You" is playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i hope if you ever talk about i don't know if you guys ever want to call in you start doing call-ins or something i hope i'm the first one so oh yeah you're definitely gonna be the first one on the call-in champ <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome <laughs> i'm gonna give you advice on like leveling your foundations <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna need it because i have no idea about it. <laughs> don't say that aloud <laughs> we'll <hire> you now. <laughs> well what's funny is we talked about this yesterday it's like basically when i were leaving i was like well when i'm leaving you know i literally have to go um, in this weird way, like prove myself all over again. Um, and so you, you laughed at that yesterday and we laughed at it. So yeah, uh, that'd be an interesting part of all this. That's basically in any new job you get, even if it's right. related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yourself. You're gonna be proving yourself for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's basically. true. <laughs> Welcome to being a grown up. <laughs> oh man. All right. You want to take us out, Kyle? Sure. Well, this has been another of record weekly. We've been hitting you with the dailies. Now we hit you with the weekly. Um, I hope you guys, we'll see you tomorrow actually, because we'll have our last daily of the week on Friday. Um, send us a bomb voyage on the way out of here. So uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye listeners. Goodbye.